you. Um, I wanted to um, tell you, first of all, kind of how this whole thing came about. And um, this um, whole forum has been put together by the Coalition for Community Wellness. And we have very a lot of different partners. Um, let me list them and make sure I don't miss any of them. Um, the American Lung Association, the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department, Santa Barbara Cottage um, Health Systems, Sansom Clinic, Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics, Santa Barbara M Medical Society, Sansom Diabetes Research Institute, in collaboration with Santa Barbara City College. And um, we've been working very, very closely with a lot of the staff of the city um, of Santa Barbara. And just some housekeeping, if you have to go to the bathroom, you get to um, <laughs> raise your hand and then we'll dismiss you. And then you can um, go up the stairs here. We will all know if you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> if you have, um, if you're here for CEUs, continuing education credit, we have them available. And there, if you you need to sign up in the back table back there, we have CEUs for RNs, LBNs, M MFTs, LCSWs, and CNAs. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about how the uh, Coalition for Community Wellness came about. Um, it was it all started at a, a Gaucho's um, women's basketball game. And a conversation between two people, one public health advocate, um, Kathleen Michelson, at the time Kathleen Rodriguez, and Helene Schneider. And I don't know, I wasn't there for the conversation, but I would imagine the conversation kind of went, um, that, that Helene mentioned that they have to do an update to this. It's a three-year process for updating the, the plan for how, how the Santa Barbara community is going to be for the next 20 years. And I would imagine Kathleen went, well, have you really considered a lot of aspects to the plan that involve the health of this community? Uh, we've got a lot of issues out there. We've got obesity. We've got issues around um, air quality. We've got issues about making our communities walkable, uh, bike trails, uh, bike lanes, a whole variety of things. And the two of them got their heads together and started getting on the, on the phone and calling a lot of people who they thought might be interested in actually putting together a coalition. And thus the birth of, thank you, Gauchos. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of introducing our moderator for, the, for this evening, or this afternoon. It feels like evening, uh, this morning. Um, before I do, the, however, is on your seats, there are little cards, and um, those are for the purpose as questions come up and you have a question, please write it down, and there will be the coalition members will actually be around to pick them up so that at some point um, during the, the forum, uh, the panel members and the, the keynote speaker, Dr. Jackson, will be able to address them. So that's what they're there for. Um, we, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Daniel Isofano, and he's no newcomer to this community. He's been working with the uh, development of the plan, um, the general plan for, oh gosh, years actually. And, you know, he's an outsider from a different community, and I thought, mm, you know, and I was so impressed with his masterful skills and facilitation. And he knows all the players. He's been around. He knows what's going on. Um, he's the founding principal of MIG uh, with over 25 years of experience in urban planning and community design. He is nationally recognized as an expert and innovator in the areas of community participation, consensus building, and facilitation. His projects have addressed issues including public transit, public health, housing, economic development, and land use and regional growth. He is working closely with residents and stakeholders in Santa Barbara to design and incorporate a groundbreaking health policy element into the city's general plan update. He's the author of several books, including Meeting of the Minds and the Inclusive City. Daniel. Sure. Thank you very much, Jane, and welcome to all of you for coming out to this very, very special event, <laughs> which is uh, creating a healthy community for the city of Santa Barbara. We want to thank all of our sponsors who have done an outstanding job in convening this uh, very well-renowned speaker, Dr. Dick Jackson, and also an excellent panel of local and regional experts dealing with all matters of 
community health and the environment. I also want to acknowledge our City Council and Planning Commission members who are here, Grant House, Mayor Pro Tem, and Helene Schneider, George Myers, the Chair of the Planning Commission, Bendy White, Bruce Bartlett, Stella Larson, and Addison Thompson, and all the boards and commissions of the cities. Let's give them a round of applause for their leadership in putting this general plan update together. As uh, Jane mentioned, this whole event is part of Plan Santa Barbara. It's a multi-year effort to update the city's general plan. Of course, we'll be looking at all the elements, including land use, transportation, housing, open space, and so forth. And you are all well aware that Santa Barbara has a long history of innovation when it comes to city planning and environmental concerns. Way back 1982, uh, the city passed the famous Charter Amendment, which requires the city to live within resources. And then later, Measure E, which formed the basis for our current general plan uh, and limited growth in both residential and non-residential areas. So we do uh, hope to continue in this tradition, and we expect that we'll be examining new conditions that are affecting the city, including uh, the environment, energy, water quality. Back in the 80s and early 90s, it was water supply that was one of the big issues here in town, as you all know. And of course, design, which Santa Barbarans care fiercely and care greatly about the quality of the physical environment, uh, as well as all of these other factors. We expect we'll be reaffirming the growth framework that has been put in place and has served the city so well for so many years. Our process for updating the general plan began back in 2007 and actually earlier with a series of staff reports and studies. Uh, but we had a series of public workshops, which went very well. We had hundreds of people participating throughout the city. And now we're launching with today's forum uh, a community uh, event series that includes more uh, panels such as the one we're having today and also a series of public workshops that will be held back in April and May of this year. So stay tuned, make sure you're on our mailing list so you can be uh, made aware of all these upcoming events. But we have several years to go before the general plan will be uh, fully updated and uh, complete. And of course, you'll know a lot about this by the time the process is over. I did want to just mention regarding our agenda today, uh, we're going to have the keynote address by Dr. Jackson, and following that there will be a short break, so we will not have any Q&A after uh, Dr. Jackson's presentation. We'll go into our panelists, and then we expect to have a Q&A and hopefully time for questions and answers there, and Dr. Jackson will join the panel, so we'll have an opportunity to get him interacting with everybody else. So that's how we'd like the day to progress. And now I have the very great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Jackson, who is uh, both an MD and a public health professional. Uh, he has a very long and illustrious career. He's the former director of the Center for Environmental Health uh, uh, at the CDC, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. He's the former director for the State of California Departments of Health Services. So you can see his career spans many geographic areas of the country. He's also author uh, with uh, another gentleman of Urban Sprawl and Public Health. So he's been very active in documenting and researching the connections of health in the built environment. But also now, currently, he will be the director for the Graham Institute for Environmental Sustainability at the University of Michigan. They were very uh, fortunate to steal him away from UC Berkeley. Uh, he'll be an endowed uh, professor of public health there and uh, really adding greatly to the profession and to this whole field. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackson certainly lectures all over the world, and as the vanguard of this whole movement linking uh, environment and health, he could be giving three talks a day, as he likes to say, and he pretty much just about does that. Uh, and he's very sought after, as you know, as a speaker for uh, many uh, conferences and events such as this. Uh, he's been tireless in his pursuit of these issues. He's been inspiring generations of professionals across a wide spectrum of disciplines, not only in medicine and health, but also public policy, architecture, urban planning, environmental design, and many others. And he's taught us how our personal health and our community health and our family uh, uh, health all really 
are indeed our most important assets. And so let's give uh, Dr. Dick Jackson a very warm Santa Barbara welcome. Good morning. Let me turn the slides on. It is an act of self-torture to decide to, I was in Ann Arbor on mon Monday and it was overcast, cold, windy, and then I'm in Santa Barbara on Saturday and it's heavenly and boy, you are so lucky to live here. Um, let me go forward here. So there's my new um, email address at the University of Michigan. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, things that real doctors confront all the time. You ask a physician in Santa Barbara, do you see anybody like this? 50 year old man, two grown kids. He spends three or four hours a day in the car. And he said, comes in and he goes, Doc, I'm tired. And the doctor asks some more questions, finds out the man gets no exercise, weighs him, he's 30 pounds overweight, his blood pressure is too high, checks him out, his cholesterol is too high, his blood sugar is too high. And so, of course, the doctor sends the person off for a meeting with a nutritionist, says, you might want to talk about to a psychotherapist, you might want to reduce the demands in your life. Um, you need to walk a lot more and do more exercise. And so two months later, he comes back to see the doctor and uh, says, well, the insurance company only covered uh, two meetings with a the nutritionist. They'd spend the $35,000 on stomach stapling surgery, but only two meetings with a nutritionist. And they'd only covered two meetings with a psychotherapist. And doc, the day is too full. I've got no time to exercise. Um, and so two months later, where is this patient? He's taking something for his blood pressure, something for his cholesterol, something for his depression. Um, he's so irritating to his wife, she's left him. He's now taking Viagra. Things are not going well. And he's spending $385 a month on medical care, uh, on drugs alone. These are the diseases of the 21st century. A hundred years ago, if you look to see what people were sick with, they were all the infectious diseases. Um, the leading causes of death, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and the rest. Our average lifespan was about 35 years. And people absolutely understood that how you felt was connected to where you lived. Was the house warm? Was it crowded? Was it damp? Was there sunlight? One of the real leaders on this whole connection between the built environment and where people live and their health was this man, he's one of my heroes, his name is Frederick Law Olmsted. And you may have heard of him as the man that designed many of the places we love most in the United States of America. Uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, the parks in all of our major cities, the Emerald Necklace in Boston. He even designed a wonderful bicycle and carriage routes all up and down the Los Angeles River for 100 miles, which by the way were never put in place. Imagine what LA would have been like if they had put those parks in place 100 years ago. But he was also a health leader. The Union Army was losing more than half their soldiers to disease. The slightest wound was causing people to develop infections and die, the soldiers. He became head of the Sanitary Commission at the request of President Lincoln. And the survival, in a very short time, he worked with Clara Barton and others, the survival of Union soldiers doubled because of basically changing the physical environment of where they're being cared for. Sunlight, fresh air, decent food, decent water, uh, cleanliness. And I'm going to argue that the lessons of changing the physical environment and improving, and improving people's health can be transferred to the 21st century as well. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Could some kind soul take me back to... Uh, wherever I was. I guess I held it down too long. Um, in the beginning, yes. One more, one more. And that again. Okay. These are the diseases of the 21st century, the big killers, the chronic diseases, and you know this. So, you pick up the newspaper and there are three headlines about some new medical advance. 
And, you know, things are so much better now. We've got doctors that can fix things and wonderful drugs and chemotherapy and radiation therapy and surgical therapy. Lifespan of Americans have improved 30 years since the 1890s. How much of that do you think was due to all the stuff that's in the headlines, the medical care? Five years. All the rest was changing the environment and immunization. Clean water, clean food, less crowded housing, better housing, um, and prosperity. I spent 10 years in Atlanta as the head of the National Center for Environmental Health, and I worried about really small things like parts per million and parts per billion and chemicals in our bodies and chemicals in our environment. And I worried about big things, climate change and the rest. And in 1999, the head of CDC uh, called all his directors in and said, um, I'm writing a paper for the Journal of the American Medical Association on what are the big diseases of the 21st century, and um, I'm driving over there, and I'm thinking about air pollution and water pollution. And the head of the Chronic Disease Center is thinking about the epidemic of diabetes and obesity and cancer. And the head of the National Center for Health Statistics is thinking about the fact that the U.S. population is going to double from 300 million to 600 million in the 21st century. And the Injury Center chief is thinking about the leading cause of death in America is in injuries. And every one of us was thinking about our own little disease entity. I looked over to the right side of Buford Highway where my office was located, and I see an elderly woman walking along. She had reddish hair, and she was bent over with osteoporosis. She's about 75. She had a plastic shopping bag, one in each hand, really heavy. And she was struggling. It was 95 degrees outside. And she reminded me of my mother. And I wanted to stop and give her a ride. I didn't have time, and men don't offer women rides in America. But um, So I got to that meeting, and we're talking about all this high-flown stuff. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, God, if that poor woman collapses from heat stroke and dies, the cause of death will be written down as heat stroke. And it won't be written down as absence of trees, absence of public transportation, heat island effects, bad air quality. And if she's killed by a truck going by over there, the cause of death will be motor vehicle trauma, and it won't be absence of sidewalks, absence of public transportation, poor urban planning, failed political leadership. And that's the essence of public health, is we are supposed to be worrying about the causes of the causes of death. The doc writes the cause of death, but it's the causes of the cause of death that you get your maximum benefit in going after. So at this meeting, um, we picked out the 10 big diseases of the 21st century. Here are four of them, and they're kind of what you'd expect, obesity, diabetes, mental health issues, um, big climate issues, and the rest. And what struck me was we viewed them as different and isolated diseases, but in fact, they were all the same. They were all part of an overall epidemic that was related to how we live, how we design the places that we live, and our, our lifestyle. They're all part of a syndemic, a weaving together of multiple epidemics. And I won't go through that in great length, but uh, we can come back to it, because the way you treat syndemics is you have to go after the system and not simply the isolated disease entity. So I went back to my staff and I said to the head of the air unit, you know, I think the real issue with air pollution is the fact that everybody's driving all the time and we got too many cars and, and, and I think the real issue with water pollution is we've paved over the planet and the real issue with injuries is we spend too much time in the car and we drive too much. And I think it's really about urban planning and how we design communities. And, you know, they, because I was the boss and they, you know, they, I expect them to say, well, Gee, Doc, you're really brilliant to come up with that. And instead they said, Dick, you don't know anything about urban planning, and you don't know what you're talking about. This doesn't make any sense. We're not going to spend any time on that. And um, so I talked to a couple of colleagues, Howie Frumpkin, who I eventually wrote the book with, and I said, Howie, I think this all comes, much of this comes down to how we're designing our communities in America. So... I got together with another colleague, and this is about 2001 now, and we wrote a paper, a thought paper, and we went through all the ways that urban design could affect health, and we put out this thought piece, and I thought it was really quite a terrific piece, and it was greeted by the National Association of Home Builders, who publicly accused me on the front page of their newsletter of being guilty of worse than junk science. 
And 14 members of Congress wrote to the CDC director and said Jackson should be fired um, because he's saying bad things about how we're building America. And um, my pushback on that was this, which is, look, the purpose of public health is to fulfill society's interests. It's not to order you around about don't smoke, don't eat bad stuff, exercise more. I mean, we try and do that, but it doesn't work. It's about creating the conditions where people can be healthy. It's exactly the role of your political leaders. It's exactly the role of your urban planners and the architects and the designers. They are all public health officials as well, creating the conditions where people can be healthy. We've created conditions that really, in many ways, drive people towards ill health. We have now paved over the area equivalent of the state of Georgia. 60,000 square miles is impervious surface, gets hot in the summertime, produces no oxygen when the sun shines, um, and runs off whenever uh, rain occurs, carrying pollutants into the rivers and streams. That's the whole United States. Uh, curse of my life for bad batteries. I think I'm going to have to go like this and ask somebody to go to the next slide, okay? Just toggle to the next. Next, please. Hit the button on the bottom right that points the arrow to the right. Is it stuck up there, too? The next slide is a map of California, and it shows the removal of our best agricultural land. And one of the things that's striking about that is that um, all of our best agricultural counties, when you think about them, Santa Clara, Orange County, even Ventura, have really been paved over. What do you think the leading agricultural county in 1945 was in California? It was Los Angeles, that's right, in both quantity produced and value of what was being produced. Has it frozen? Um. Oh, all right. Um, there you go. Okay, next. Oh, no. Oh, and in this paving, we've spent colossal amounts of money. This is the California state flower, and it costs... <laughs> It costs a billion dollars to produce, and within three to five years of being produced, it's stopped. You all know this. Next. And our cities have become larger and larger. When I was a medical student in San Francisco, Monterey was a separate town from San Francisco, was separate from Sacramento, was separate from Auburn. Now it's one large city. You can go the whole distance without really seeing any open land whatsoever. Next. And as we've, as we've spread out our population, people end up driving more and more and more. And um, we have underinvested in public transportation. And this is, this, I would argue that this is more than a convenience issue. It's more than an energy efficiency issue. This is the congressional district where Newt Gingrich came from. And they, in uh, North Western Atlanta resisted having public transportation go up there because, quote unquote, it might bring in the wrong element. Does this sound familiar? And so everybody was going to drive their car. They're up to 23 lanes and it's still stopped um, three to four hours a day in morning and night. Next, please. As you pave things over, you know, in the forest, when the rain falls, it does exactly what we want. The trees slow it down. It percolates into the ground. The water comes off slowly over time, and it's pure and, and of good quality, and we can drink it. If it lands on a parking lot in those 60,000 square miles of impervious surface, everything coming off the tire, out of the engine, and all the rest goes into the major um, aquifers and the drinking water supplies in that area. And about 75% of the water runs off in an urban area. This is, this is the most valuable commodity, probably more than oil, in the 21st century, by the way, good quality fresh water. 
So we've paved over the uh, nation in many ways, spent a lot of time in the cars. When I was young, we worried about air pollution from big old factories and all the rest. That's been controlled partly because we sent it all to China. But the other, our real air pollution problems are now in the places that are hot, the wind doesn't blow, and people drive a great deal. More than half of our, all of our air pollution now, now comes from cars. I never would have predicted that the five worst air polluted cities in America you know, 30 years ago would have been valley towns in California. As this stuff is put out into the air, as the sun shines, air quality degrades over time, and at exactly the time we tell our kids to go out for a run, go exercise, is when ozone levels and air quality become the worst. Here's a study that was done in Los Angeles. They looked at a half a dozen schools that were badly air polluted and a half a dozen schools that had very low levels of air pollution. And at the end of five years, they looked at the kids who we would be most proud of, the kids doing you know, uh, volleyball and competitive sports. They were doing two and three sports. They did it for four or five years, uh, going through school. At the end of that time, the kids who were athletes and in the high air pollution areas had three times the rate of asthma as the kids uh, from the low air pollution areas. And so when the trucking industry says this air pollution stuff doesn't matter, it isn't true. It absolutely does matter to people's health. Remember the doc from the injury center said, well, oh, the leading cause of death in most of the age groups in the United States and the leading cause of years of life lost is injuries. And most of that is due to cars. This, this is the point. The red box is just from various age groups. That's the leading cause of death. Places, the more people drive, the more they die in car crashes. And so when someone says, we don't want people commuting back and forth from Santa Maria or down from Ventura, or they're driving back and forth and creating air pollution, well, in fact, you could save a lot of money and a lot of air pollution by having decent public transit going back and forth in those two directions, number one. But every time you drive 66 miles in America, 66 miles gives you a one in a million risk of dying. In fact, if you said to an American, who's more likely to die in a pool of blood, uh, the urbanite that's living in Oakland or the person who's commuting in and out of Santa Barbara, they'd say, oh, the urbanite living in Oakland. But the truth is, it's the person that's driving. Suburbanites who are doing a lot of driving have the higher rate of violent death, injury-related death, than people that live in urban areas, 66 miles. And if someone says, oh, there's a one in a million risk of building on that vacant lot or that other spot because, you know, there's a little bit of chromium from 30 years ago or some chemical and there well, the people that can't afford to live here, uh, partly because there isn't development going on in these areas and are driving 66 miles every day, are buying those risks every day, not for a lifetime of exposure. Next slide, please. Oh, the point of that last slide, by the way, is simply that sprawling areas have much higher death rates in cars. And not only that, sprawling areas, I thought, would have higher death rates for pedestrians. Doesn't look like it's true. In fact, if you look at it, it looks like Texas, the death rate is pretty low. It took a while to figure out, well, they hadn't invented pedestrians in Texas yet. And um, next slide. So if you look at, no, go back. If you look at the actual rate um, per pedestrian, of course, the sprawling places that aren't designed, that are designed against pedestrians, are the ones with the highest uh, death rates. Go ahead, please. Well, there's a lot of debate in America, and, and we all agree, 90% of us agree on one thing. We may not agree in the war, but we agree that Americans are too fat. And here is a map, the next slide, a map of obesity rates in the United States in 1990. This, here's California with less than 10% of our population being obese, having a body mass index that exceeds um, 30. Next. By 1997, it's become quite a bit darker. It's 15 to 19 percent of our population. You can see some, there's a brand new color. Some of our count, uh, states are now over 20 percent of the population being obese. And by, not, by 2004, uh, another brand new color added, a uh, new meaning for the word red states, and um, over 25 percent of the population in those states um, obese, not just overweight, but obese. Average American has gained about a pound a year over the last 25 years. Average 11-year-old boy in America is 11 pounds heavier than he was in 1973. And I got, we started an internship, 11 pounds heavier. Being obese is, is bad for, well, let me, this, by the way, it's a technical looking slide, but the simple version of it is what I just showed you is based upon telephone interviews. Um, it's wrong. 
when you actually go back and ask people in person how much do you weigh, they're a little heavier and a little shorter. And when you actually measure them, they're even a little heavier and a little shorter, and women fib more than men. <laughs> Next. Ann Patterson will be showing data on children in Santa Barbara County, but here's kids under age five that exceed the 95th percentile for weight for their height. And you can see about 15, 16 percent of California kids. And this is when I first arrived in California and the governor's office, Governor Schwarzenegger's office, asked me what would be my priorities. I had terrorism and preparedness, number one. I had the workforce for public health, number two. And I had the obesity epidemic, number three. So I had to show some of these slides. The next one is actual rates for um, school-age kids. And we're now at 22% of our school-age kids exceeding the 95th percentile. Wouldn't you wish that was our SAT scores instead of our obesity scores? Next, please. And, and, and we'll be giving local data next. Thank you. This has affected every single aspect of our health care system. And I'm sure there's some health care administrators here or, or administrators in other shops. Every industry you've had put in heavier chairs. They used to get by with E-150 ambulances, you know, like the F-150, the Ford trucks. Now they're E-350s that can handle patients that weigh as much as five to 700 pounds. Um, think about the additional cost when that happens. And they've had to change the gurneys as well. Um, next. And these, again, cost about three to five times as much as the old gurneys that were being used. We're having to retool America for the obesity epidemic. Um, you all know that uh, flying on airplanes has become more and more uncomfortable as we've become bigger and bigger, but it's uncomfortable for the airlines, too, because um, this is when I, when I did this a few years ago. I, I thought, you know, I wonder how much jet fuel was burned by the fact that we've all gained 10 pounds in the last 10 years. So we calculate miles flown and all this, and it comes out to a billion dollars worth of jet fuel. And it's the only study I ever did that was published after we published it. It got so much attention, and it was cited by Jay Leno that night. Who, who said, now I know why they don't feed us on airplanes anymore. <laughs> um, this, is, this is back when they had writers. They can't do this anymore. <laughs> Thanks. And think of this. A billion gallons of, of uh, gasoline are burned by the fact that Americans are 10 pounds heavier at the same time. I mean, it just affects every aspect of our society. It's changed medical care. When my son was doing his junior rotation in surgery at, at, in medical school, I said, how is it? He goes, it's awful. I'm doing nothing but holding retractors and cameras in stomach in the bariatric surgery, stomach stapling surgeries, because it is just the mainstay of a lot of the hospitals, both in terms of revenue and other things. It's not a trivial surgery. In fact, look at the graph of the increase of rates of stomach stapling surgery um, in the United States. You don't need to be an epidemiologist to look at this and go, oh my God, there's something really wrong here. Being overweight is bad for us. It's bad for our, it raises our risk of stroke. It raises our risk of high blood pressure. It raises our risk of heart disease. It raises our risk of joint problems. It raises a woman's risk who's pr uh, pregnant of having a baby with birth defects. But one of the things we worry about most is it deeply raises the risk of becoming diabetic. Here are the, this is a complicated graph, and I apologize for it, but it's important. What it shows is as your body mass index goes up, your weight to height ratio goes up your risk of becoming diabetic goes up dramatically. And so for a woman who's at the stomach stapling level, at body mass index of 35, she has almost 100 times the risk of becoming diabetic compared to a woman who's thin. This is a huge increase. And for a man, it's about 30 to 40 times the risk. Um, but, you know, once you get over about 26, 27, you're buying extra risk points for diabetes. Here are the rates of diabetes in the early 1990s. You can see California in a light blue there, um, five to six percent. I can't see with my glasses off. Next, please. Um, again, a new color, and you can see uh, the rates of diabetes going up nationally. And by uh, 2001, over that's yellow is over 12 percent of the people in Florida have diabetes. This is a disease that costs people their eyes, retinopathy. It costs them their kidneys. It costs them their feet, gangrene of the feet. Um, average reduction in lifespan of about 15 years um, if you become diabetic. Average reduction in the quality of life. Go ahead. Next one. 
if you're thinking about investments, this is a sad one, but this is an industry that's booming, that is prosthetics, that um, because the loss of limbs, the doubling of the rate of diabetics in our society, the loss of limbs has increased dramatically. And now you've got much heavier patients in terms of the design of, of prostheses. You know, the, when the governor heard about the obesity epidemic, the response was, well, that's really about personal decisions. It's about self-discipline. If you just have more self-discipline, you can overcome anything. And, and, and he's right, and he's an example of that. But my argument today is that many of the problems that we're dealing with in our society are shaped by the design of the environments that we are in. And this is the one that really got um, the governor's office's attention. The current generation of children, if these trends continue that I just showed you, will live, um, girls will live on average about 14 years less long than their parents if these trends continue. Your quality of life down by about 20 years. Your quality of life, if, you, if you're, um, you've lost a limb, you have gangrene of the feet, and you have, uh, you're going for kidney dialysis, is not very good. Next. So fitness is important. I was taught, and Anne, when you were uh, in nutrition school at, at the School of Public Health at Berkeley, um, you know, I was taught nutrition was, was important, but I wasn't taught that fitness was all important. Here's a study of 100,000 nurses of my generational cohort, and they were followed from about the mid-1970s till today. So here are the nurses that stayed thin and fit, and they had a standardized death rate of one. What do you think it is? Go ahead. These are the nurses who became obese. They had a 90% increase in death, all-cause mortality. What do you think happened to the nurses who became unfit but stayed thin? Next, 60% increase. And the nurses that did both became obese and overweight two and a half times. So being obese is a matter of life and death, but being out of shape or being in a place that prohibits you from being in shape is a matter of life and death. Has this affected other age groups? I, I, I know, in fact, I, I work with Tom Torlakson. There's a requirement now in our schools to have a fitness gram, Senator Torlakson, um, in our schools. When this was done, it's about two, three-year-old data now, 75% of our school-age kids, including high school kids, could not pass a fitness test. And this was not hard stuff. There were six measures, but one of them is to run, walk a 12-minute mile. There are 70-year-olds in Santa Barbara, I'm sure, who can run walk um, a 12-minute mile. And three-quarters of our kids can't do it. That's extremely worrying. By the way, two out of seven now military uh, volunteers in the United States cannot get into the military because of either overweight or lack of fitness, extreme lack of fitness. I'm going to argue that some of this is because we've removed incidental exercise from our lives. This is the rate of walking and biking to do errands in... Um, the Netherlands and in Germany. It's pretty high, right? 40, 50 percent of all the trips are done walking and biking. What do you think it is in the United States of America? Go ahead. Seven percent. Even Canada with its weather. You know, and it's typical. Americans will get in a car and drive three blocks to buy a newspaper. Next, please. Or to walk the dog. Yeah. Now, we... <laughs> And the other thing is, you know, we don't value incidental exercise, and we think the exercise that really matters is stuff we pay a membership fee, and we have to go into a club, and we get on a machine, and we exercise and climb stairs. And then we build neighborhoods like this. And imagine if you're an eight-year-old kid living in that top house in the cul-de-sac, and you want to go see your eight-year-old friend that's at the far corner of the picture. Well, you, you can um, get on your little bike, and you can bike down, and you can bike around, and you can bike three miles away and finally get to your friend's house. Or, you know, you can climb over the fence and uh, um, climb over the fence and pass the Doberman and the Rottweiler and the pervert and the guy with the gun and, and uh, over with the, uh, go see your friend. But, of course, you don't do that. The first word out of your mouth is, Mom, drive me. So the women my age in this room drive twice as much as your mother did, your daughter will drive twice as much as you did, and in large part it's because of the way we design communities that don't connect people to each other. And think about the impact in the environment. We're doing all these nonsense errands and burning fossil fuels to do it instead of the legs that God gave us. Um, the more time you spend in the car, proven. My co-author co Larry Frank has proven the more likely you are to be obese. I'll keep going. 
How important is food? Keep going. Well, you can't eat stuff like this and uh, lose weight. That's a day's worth of calories for about two and a half bucks. Um, it's a bargain. We'll come back to it. <laughs> it's going to be hard for kids and other people to get control of their weight if fast food joints are planted right next to schools and near places that um, kids congregate or the whole population. And note that poor neighborhoods have two and a half times the numbers of fast food places as well-off neighborhoods. In fact, in a well -off, uh, poor neighborhood, it's often hard. So, so when someone says, hey, it's a bargain, you should... Um, supersize the meal, and it's true, for 67 cents you can get 75% you know, more calories. That's a bargain. Next slide, but is it? Every ounce of fat you put on your body, for guys, costs us $6 in lifetime health care costs, and for women, $3 in lifetime health care costs. Um, so that's not much of a bargain, even though you're only paying a few cents more. One of the big drivers of the epidemic, I think, is the fast food, and I think there's good evidence for that. I also think the change in soft drinks is a big driver. Decline in calcium-containing milk and increase in soft drinks in our population. A 20-ounce soda, how much sugar do you think it has? 17 teaspoons. How much exercise do you need to do to uh, burn the 250 calories off? It's about 40 minutes of basketball. And you know, you know kids that are drinking three and four of these a day. You can't burn that off. First thing the, the diabetes doctors will say to kids, by the way, when I was a young doc, we never saw kids with adult onset diabetes. We called it um, adult onset. Now we call it type 2 diabetes. And a third of the kids in the pediatric clinic for diabetes now have adult onset obesity-related diabetes. This is my nephew, Jack. He's the coolest kid going. He just turned 10. I was over at his house on uh, Easter over in Marin County, and he wanted to go skateboarding. So we went up skateboarding. I'm sitting there with his dad and my other brother. Next, and uh, he says, uh, Uncle Dick, Uncle Dick, I gave up high fructose corn sugar for Lent. <laughs> and they say, really, Jack, how was that? Well, go ahead. I, I went to the 7-Eleven and I searched for a couple hours, and the only thing I could find that didn't have high fructose corn sugar in it was sweethearts. <laughs> and he lost weight, um, by the way. Um, Jack also walks to school every day, and I, I think one of the core issues is walking to school. His mother does not let him watch very much TV, and there's a good reason. Look at the, just there are lots of reasons, but one of them is, look at the amount of um, advertising the kids are seeing, twice as much, and a lot of it is for food. But I, I love the fact when they put all kinds of fruit on a, on a label for food, and 55% of all the foods that are um, sold to children with the word fruit on them, you processed foods, have never seen a piece of fruit. The blue and the red and all the colors are dyes, not uh, from food. Next. This is the food pyramid that I was taught um, is important. What do you think the food pyramid on television is? <laughs> so, you know, they may get 40 minutes of nutrition education and eight years of school, and this is what they're getting in 40,000 advertisements a year. It's tough to turn around when the governor says, you know, it's about personal decisions, not when you're being saturated with this kind of stuff. 1973, there was no high fructose corn sugar in the diet of an American. Today, we're consuming 63 pounds each on average. It's 28 pounds of body fat at that point, 115,000 calories. I was in a meeting with the governor and, and um, the guy from Coke and the guy from Pepsi, and one of the uh, I won't say which one, said, well, if people would just exercise more, they could burn it off. And they can. You can uh, exercise for about um, 400 hours a year, uh, 318 hours a year. And so I, I didn't suggest to the governor that all workstations in state government be changed to these. But um, if we're going to continue to eat like this, this is what we need to do. Next, please. What in America has gone down since 1950? Well, one of them is the number of schools. Schools have gotten five times bigger. And I don't know about you, but I walked to a school. It was a mile away. I knew everybody. It was a lot of fun. So I didn't realize at the time. Uh, I sort of decompressed coming home. You, you know, you sort of talk to each other on the way there. Um, next slide, please. 
we've gone from six two thirds of our kids walking and biking to school with thirteen percent in just one generation and it's not because kids are lazy it's because we've made it impossible for most of them to walk to school and the schools are guilty in another way you know they have rules that you know it's thirty acres if it's a high school and twenty acres of middle school and ten acres if it's a grammar school um, they put it way outside of town then they take those acres they don't plant school gardens there they plant parking lots because everybody's got to drive back and forth to the place um, but they do save a little money on, on uh, vice principals by having these great, big, huge schools. Next slide, please. And where are the worst traffic jams? And every parent in the room knows that the worst traffic jams are next to school morning and night as the kids are being dropped off. It's a wonderful book by Richard Louvre, Last Child in the Woods, about the removal of natural contact and, and freedom and the, and the time to play. Think about a child who's popped in a car, sits in a box, going to school, sits in a box at school. They've gotten re, re, get rid of recess in a lot of our schools over time. They're sitting in the school uh, at lunchtime. They're not allowed off campus, probably for good reasons. They're back in a box going home. They're in a box when they get home. Next slide, please. Do you think it has anything to do with this? This is the sales of Ritalin in the United States of America. No other country has got their kids so medicated as we do to keep them from being active. God help us. Next slide, please. Where do kids learn better? Do they learn better in big schools or small schools? Small schools. Where are the kids happier? Small schools. Where are the teachers happier? Small schools. And yet we continue to be. So last week, one of the coalitions put together a request to the Department of Education saying we want you to build smaller and local and accessible schools and within two days and I'm not exaggerating all 58 of the county health officers signed on to the petition to go back to smaller local schools because it's a way of dealing with the obesity epidemic and a lot of other things the California Medical Association signed on and the American Academy of Pediatrics for California signed on Bill Gates absolutely Bill and Melinda Gates are leading a whole a billion dollar effort to go back to small schools because there's very good evidence that kids do better in small schools. Kids who walk and bike to school learn better, play better, and believe it or not, exercise more when they get free time than the kids who sat in a car when they were on their way to school. And we waste a colossal amount of money, a billion dollars a year on diesel fuel. Yeah, if you live in the remote hills or you're disabled, fine, have to take a car. But if you can walk, God help us, you ought to be doing it. Um, skip that. And I would argue that every school in California ought to have um, a school garden. And you go to, honestly, God, the, the, the one in Berkeley, you go visit there, and um, the first and second graders are out there, they're having a ball. The grandparents are coming in and teaching the kids how to prepare it. I walked in, and at one point, this uh, fifth or sixth grader had this great big knife, and he was cutting uh, carrots, and someone was kind of nervous about that. But, you know, what a wonderful way to teach responsibility. And the kids had developed a taste for this food. Um, is it good for the global environment? You know, I think the, the <laughs> issue of climate change is related to our consumption. Next. These are the CO2 levels on the planet. Next. And here's what, as CO2 levels for the planet goes up, the temperature of the planet goes up. There's what it looked like for 399,000 years um, measured from gas bubbles. I won't go into the details. Next slide. Um, but it, uh, I, the 11 hottest years of recorded history have occurred in the last 12. And the, I don't include the data from 2007, which is the second hottest year ever on record. The air has gotten hotter, the ground has gotten hotter, and the ocean's gotten hotter even two miles down. And the more heat, the more energy, the more active the environment is. This is the picture that Al Gore showed in his film of the melting in the summertime on Greenland. Next slide. Uh, and this is what the melting looks like. It's dramatically increased next. And here's the increase just over the last two to three years on Greenland. Enough water is coming off Greenland today to supply the, each day to these daily needs of Los Angeles. That's how rapidly it's melting. And it wasn't melting 20 years ago. When I gave this talk a year ago, I was talking about the polar ice caps disappearing in 2050 to 2070. It's now estimated possibly it will be gone by 2012. We're talking about when our kids get out of, you know, eighth graders get out of high school and having the polar ice caps gone. That's how rapidly a lot of this is moving. And for the first time, the reports are now coming out that uh, Antarctica is beginning to melt at really substantial rates as well, just in the last three days. 
and um, a whole business of tourism has erupted to go see places before they're completely gone. And people are going to the Great Barrier Reef of Australia because it will be gone because of the change in pH in the oceans and temperature by about 20 years. And California will have to rebuild, entirely rebuild the entire California water project because um, by the end of the century, about 90% of the snowpack will be gone, the April snowpack, compared to what it is today with this warming level. A lot of this is related, again, to our consumption patterns. And there are other aspects of the change in fossil fuels next. Um, we know that gasoline's going up. This is just the beginning next. Um, we are post-peak oil uh, around the world. U.S. hit peak oil in 1971, um, but Saudi Arabia is beyond peak oil, and, and uh, Mexico will stop exporting oil very, very soon because their, both their economy is developing and they're depleting their stocks. And it, it causes some of the instability, uh, the political instability, the amount of importation we're doing. You know where I'm going with this. Next. Where do we go from here? Go ahead. Go ahead. The problem of tobacco was insurmountable in our society in 1960. Next. And yet, California, by doing three things, was able to reduce tobacco smoking. Hit, hit it a couple times. Sit right there. We had to tax tobacco. We had to demonize the tobacco industry, anti-tobacco advertising, so it had to be very, very aggressive, and we had to put in place environmental controls that prevented people from smoking. Now, everybody in, you know, back in Michigan, they say, oh, you Californians, you're all crazy, but look what happened to lung cancer in California just over the last 10 years, a 22% decrease in the last 10 years because of this. Every one of you, uh, older folks at least in the room, have lost friends to lung cancer. This is a spectacular public health success. So we turn around the obesity epidemic. One is to change our diet. This is a very good book by Walt um, Willett, or at least I like it, on um, eat, drink, and be healthy and, and moving lower on the food chain. He, he Walt Willett, has been working with the CIA to change the American diet in restaurants. Next. And, and the CIA trains 10,000 chefs a year um, to eat lower on the food chain. Um, more fruits and vegetables, meats and oils be used as condiments rather than the main food source. And my wife calls this my secret service picture. Um, and, and it would make perfect sense for California, being the producer of 90% of the fruits and vegetables in the country, to have the same kind of subsidy that um, the ridiculous subsidies that we're giving uh, the Midwestern United States to grow corn that's making us fat. Next. We need to demonize bad food. And so um, food spelled backwards is doof. And if you eat too much doof, you become a doofus. So every kid in America needs, in California needs to understand this, and they are beginning to. Um, and, and as with tobacco, we need to tax things that we don't want, that people can do with a lot less of. And one of them would be high fructose corn sugar. We got by just fine before 1973 without it. If we taxed high fructose corn sugar, it's just a penny a teaspoon. You'd barely notice it it would raise $2 billion a year. And I wouldn't spend one cent of that on stomach stapling surgery. I would spend it on um, safe routes to schools, decent school lunches, PE programs, educating teachers, educating kids about nutrition. I would push for farmers markets in every town in um, California, particularly the poor neighborhoods desperately need farmers markets because they can't get fresh fruit and vegetables at a reasonable price. I'd push for the school for peri-urban agriculture. It's nonsense we were eating strawberries from 4,000 miles away when if, with greenhouses right near town we'd be getting it from down the road. We need to create environments where people can walk their 10,000 steps a day. If you walk 10,000 steps a day, you can lose about 6% of your body weight over the course of these are pre-diabetic people over the course of about six months, and your risk of diabetes goes down by about 50%. If you already have diabetes, by staying fit, your risk of dying goes down. You, you cut your risk of dying by 50%. The difference between well-designed, walkable communities and those that aren't is about six pounds in body weight. I'll skip this. Skip it. Skip this. And um, Kim will be talking about this in our... Uh, a panel. Skip this one, please. Um, 
so the home builders said uh, Jackson's guilty of junk science. Well, here is the review of all the science that's been done as to whether it really makes a difference to people's health to be in a well-designed or not well-designed community. And this is the gold standard. It does make sense. Uh, it is now one of the interventions that CDC predicts. Skip it. Skip it. And ultimately, you know, the, one of the great disease uh, disorders of the 21st century is depression. And the human species has dealt with depression very well over, you know, 100,000 years. And the way you deal with depression and isolation and loneliness um, is you got to get with other people. And psychotherapy, in a way, is talk therapy, and people are talking and trying to figure out what's going on. You've got to um, get some rest, and you've got to be in surroundings that nourish your mind. And you've got to exercise. And so what you're doing with the creation of your general plan is you are counteracting the effects of global warming. If you put more trees in and you have people walking more and not eating cars, you are counteracting the chronic disease epidemic, including obesity and depression. And what you are doing could be the greatest health contribution to the children of this city 25 and 50 years from now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Dick Jackson. Clearly, you have the right message for the right time. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll form our panel up here on the stage. We'll have Dr. Jackson also available during the break if you'd like to approach him. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions and talk with you. So please don't go far away. We're going to have a great panel in just a few minutes. Thank you. the notification list for events related to Plan Santa Barbara. We'd really appreciate your signing up on this so we can uh, get the word out to you and you in turn can spread it around to you, to your families and friends and other community organizations. That'd be extremely helpful. Um, also, we have a uh, website which deals with these topics called healthycommunitiesbydesign.org, and there's a flyer out by the door on the sign-in table. If you'd like to pick that up as well, you can log in there and keep track of these issues. There's places for you to form your own network groups and dialogue groups around these issues, and there's also a library feature so you can uh, begin to download information related to health in the built environment. We think you'll find that an extremely helpful site. It's co-sponsored by the California Endowment, one of the main sponsors within the state of California for projects uh, along the lines that Dr. Jackson has illustrated in his talk today. So we hope you take advantage of that. So we do also want to remind you, if you have the question cards, turn those in to myself or one of the staff people. Uh, Jane up here in the front will collect those. We have a number already, so we should be able to get to a number of these questions and have a dialogue and interaction with the panel members once we complete uh, their presentations. So we'd like to begin with our panel. As you know, public health and urban planning have had a very long history. It goes back well uh, before the turn of the 1900s uh, that, in fact, uh, public health concerns uh, are what drove the uh, desire for society in America to develop zoning laws. And as we know, the police powers of municipal corporations allow cities to zone land in the interest of public health, safety, and welfare, the very things that public health as a profession uh, is designed uh, to address. So we uh, enjoy that link, and now the uh, work of Dr. Jackson and many others inspired by his work has been to re-cement that link and begin to further explore how urban design, community design, and the way we shape our cities can actually improve our uh, personal and community health. So we're very excited uh, to bring Dr. Jackson in to help spur our thinking along these lines. And uh, now we also have an excellent panel to do the same thing. And I think you'll agree with me that uh, we have quite a range here of experienced 
and seasoned professionals to draw upon. I'm going to give a global introduction of all four of them, and then we could recognize uh, their participation here today. So first, we'll be hearing from Ann Patterson, who is the Director of Nutrition Programs and the Director of Women, Infants, and Children's Nutrition Program for the Santa Barbara County Health Department. She's been active here in the city since 1983 and has been very much involved in these issues throughout uh, the West, Western states, rural Colorado. She's been uh, involved in nutrition programs uh, over the last 10 and 20 years. She's also involved in many community and public service organizations helping to promote these issues, most notably the March of Dimes Health Advisory Committee, Partners for Fit Youth, and the Coalition for Community Wellness. So uh, we're very ha happy to have Ann uh, with us on the panel. Uh, she'll be followed by Nancy Rapp, who's our very own Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Santa Barbara. And uh, Nancy has been involved in this profession for over 30 years, very dedicated to parks and recreation and what they mean as creating community for our city. And she's been involved in many community-based organizations, Boys and Girls Club. She was very instrumental in the UCLA Recreation Program, helping them gain national prominence for fitness and wellness programs uh, uh, dealing with uh, parks and outdoor spaces. And of course, she heads up now a very uh, wide range of services offered by our Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department, dealing with school programs, youth and adult sports, and many, many other things. Uh, she'll be followed by Terry Dressler, who is the Air Pollution Control Officer for the Air Pollution Control District here on the South Coast. Terry was appointed the control officer in 2004, and he's been uh, in and around and very active on the South Coast in our neighboring counties for the last uh, 15, 20 years or more, uh, working in San Luis Obispo County, also for the Air District there. He's been involved with Ventura County as well, and he's held a whole range of ins uh, positions from inspector all the way on up to uh, control officer. So again, he brings some real uh, nuts and bolts experience in dealing with these issues uh, here in our region. And then uh, the fourth and final panelist will be Brian Welch, who is a principal with the noted firm of Fair and Peers, transportation consultants. They are also involved with us on our general plan update, working very closely with uh, staff here at the city to develop our planning uh, models and systems for the general plan. And Brian has been in charge of the LA Office of Fear and Peers for a number of years now and uh, over 25 plus years in the field of transportation in general. And he's worked throughout the whole West, pretty much all the Western states. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He's involved in the international transportation organizations. And uh, he and his firm have been very much active in promoting uh, concepts of pedestrian uh, and uh, bicycle uh, conditions in our cities. So please uh, join me in welcoming the entire panel of speakers here for us this morning. Thank you, and with that, I'd like to uh, bring up our very first speaker, Ann Patterson, to start us off this, with the panel. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with Dr. Jackson and the rest of the panel. And um, as a nutritionist, my job today is to represent nutrition and um, try to see how that fits into city planning. So we'll just see if this works. And maybe it doesn't. Oh, shoot. Am I doing it? Okay, here we go. All right, so what, what I want to do is localize some of the information that Dr. Jackson talked about, and I'm really glad he showed those slides about the um, obesity in America because I think those are really dramatic and, and compelling. And what I wanted to do is show you what's going on in Santa Barbara. And um, actually, the rates in Santa Barbara are very similar to those in California. 28% of our children are overweight or obese. And, you know, with all the, the data, it depends on what studies you look at and how they, you know, what, they're, what, they, um, what the population is. 
But this is actually a really good one because this is from the fitness gram that Dr. Jackson talked about in its um, 2004 data. And it's, it tests all the, ki all the children in public schools in the fifth, seventh, and ninth grades. So it's a, that one's a pretty good rate, and, um, but it's not a great number. 28% of our kids are overweight. By the time they're teens, it's 36%. And adults, it's 54%. So even though we live in this fabulous place and we have this wonderful environment and all the great opportunities for um, physical activity, we still have very high rates of obesity. Let's see if I can make this. Oops. All right, so now um, just to talk a little bit about the, um, the diseases, and again, I'm not going to reiterate everything that Dr. Jackson said, but just sort of bring it home as um, to compare our county with California. And you can see that diabetes, we actually have a higher rate of diabetes than the state average in Santa Barbara. These are countywide rates. And this is um, people who are diagnosed with diabetes as well as um, pre-diabetes, so they have risks for diabetes, and if, if they don't do something about that, they will develop type 2 diabetes. And then I thought it, it might be interesting to show you um, how many people that actually is, because 9.2 percent maybe doesn't sound that bad, but it's almost 39,000 people. Heart disease, we're doing a little bit better than the state, 5.8 percent um, versus 6 0.2% in California, but still it's t over 24,000 people. High blood pressure, we're also a little bit lower at 22% versus 25% for the state, but again, it's almost 93,000 people. And high cholesterol, 19% versus 22% in the state, but again, it's 80,000 people. So it's a lot of people that are affected by these diseases. And this is affecting their quality of life and, of course, medical care and all of the medications that are required. And a lot of these people have multiple problems, so um, it's, it makes it even worse. Uh oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Let's see if I... Okay, so... What nutrition-related factors can be addressed in city, city planning? And I was talking to Nancy right before um, this the started today, and usually as a nutritionist, I talk about nutrition and physical activity hand in hand because you can't separate the two. And so all of the things about walkability and biking, and that has to play a role, and it's just as important in this whole epidemic. But I was going to, my role was to kind of focus on what nutrition or um, food sort of issues we could, we could look at. And so the obvious one is access to healthy foods for all residents. And we do have challenges. Again, Dr. Jackson brought this up. I'm so glad my, <laughs> my stuff goes with this. But um, the, fast <laughs> the fast food restaurants are a problem and convenience stores and liquor stores. So um, a year ago, the Center for California Center for Public Health Advocacy, which is based up in Davis, did a study, released a study, and they looked at fast food outlets and convenience stores and all the different um, food outlets around the state. And they, for our county, because we're not as populated as some of the places, they gave us countywide data, but some of the cities, there's, they have city data. And even in our county, we have three times as many fast food restaurants and convenience stores as supermarkets and produce vendors, which I was really surprised to hear. Dang. <laughs> You'd think I'd get this <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. So why is this a problem? Uh, studies have showed that there's a relationship between available food and health. And where there are high numbers of fast food restaurants compared to grocery stores, you have higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. On the other hand, people who live near supermarkets tend to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, and they have lower rates of obesity. Another problem with fast food restaurants is it's associated with consuming more calories, fewer vegetables, and higher obesity rates. See if I can get, do it right this time. Yay. And I'm going to use this because I've never gotten to do this before. Yay. 
Um, <laughs> I think I'll just play with it. Um, anyway, this is from that same study from the California Center on Public Health Advocacy, showing in graphic pie chart design the um, retail food outlets in Santa Barbara County. So you can see that 50% are fast food, 25% are convenience stores, and only 25% are supermarkets at 17, produce stores 4%, and farmers markets at 4%. So even though we have fabulous farmers markets and some great produce stands, it's a very small percentage of the total food available in our county. So I'm really gl glad I got to use this. Okay, so now what can we do? The goal should be that federal, state, and local policymakers enact policies to provide safe, convenient access to healthy foods for all residents. And then just a few examples, there are many, but I just picked out a few things that could be done in the planning process. And that is to increase the number of grocery stores and produce vendors in neighborhoods with limited access to healthy foods. Also to set reasonable limits on the number of fast food restaurants and convenience stores in neighborhoods. Number three, require fast food restaurants to provide consumers with nutrition information. And some of you might remember that just last year in our state um, Senate and Assembly, they passed SB 120, which was going to do this very thing and require fast food restaurants of a certain size that had a certain number of um, facilities to post their nutrition labeling information. Well, you can imagine there was a huge lobby against that, and it turned out that the governor vetoed that bill. But it's a, it's a good idea. Um, number four, eliminate fast uh, use of trans fats used in restaurants, and trans fats are one of the least healthy or probably the most unhealthy fats, and they're used a lot in convenience foods and frying. And you probably know that New York City has banned trans fats in their restaurants, and I'm thinking, well, if New York City can do it, why can't Santa Barbara do that? So that's, a, that's an idea. Um, and then increasing community gardens and farmers markets, like Dr. Jackson said. So those are just a few ideas, and just to kind of you know, plant the seed that there is a role for nutrition in city planning, and I hope I've given you some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. We're going to move right on to Nancy Rapp. And again, we're collecting your cards down here. Please uh, don't hesitate to turn those in. Oh boy, now I get to play with this thing, and I'm not that much more technically inclined, so we'll see how I do. All right, and I went too fast, and that's the wrong way. Let's try this again, going backwards. All right. Okay. You know, in preparing to talk to you this morning, I, I did quite a bit of research um, because I wanted to get the broader picture, and there are a lot of people um, much more talented than I that have spent years doing research about the value of parks to our community. Two of the best resources I found were the National Park and Recreation Association and the Trust for Public Land. Um, the Trust for Public Land did an extensive uh, research survey related to the value of parks in our community and the benefits of parks was the document. It has several other support documents as well. Um, and it was, I, this was one of the quotes that just summarized the whole thing about the value of parks in our community. City parks and open space improve our physical and psychological health. They strengthen our communities and they make our cities and neighborhoods more attractive places to live and work. I know I feel that way just speaking as a, as a resident of this community, and I'm sure that you will agree. When you do get it to work, it's really sensitive. Okay, the benefits of our parks are have a lot, but basically they fall into four categories. Um, Physical activity makes people happier and healthier. Access to parks 
it has been proven to um, show that it increases the frequency at which people will exercise. And there's also documented studies to show that the exposure to nature and greenery makes people happier. And I just will share with you, I just, you know, sometimes you just have to stop and look up and ask yourself, why does this place feel different from a different, from other places in the community? And I was over at Bonnet Park um, attending the grand opening or reopening of the West Side Boys and Girls Club and driving around that community, which, you know, I, I, I do frequently. But I was at the intersection of Mitchell Terena and San Andres, and it just felt hot and dry. And I'm asking myself, why does it feel this way? I just came from another block in that stretch of road on San Andres, and I realize it's the tree canopy cover that we have on our streets that totally changes how we feel about how a community looks or how welcoming it is and how much time we might want to spend walking um, if we have that choice. Um, economic benefits to parks, increased property values has been proven time and again, and parks play a major role, as do schools, in attracting and retaining businesses and residents. We are learning more and more about the relationship between parks and our, our environment um, in terms of pollution abatement and cooling. I just talked about our urban forest and certainly uh, controlling stormwater runoff with all of the green space that we have. Parks create stable neighbor neighborhoods and really build communities and um, amongst, for me, one of the most important aspects is Parks provide the opportunity for recreation, and we all can, you know, just appreciate the value of play. When we think of our community parks in Santa Barbara, we really need to think broad, because our parks include, when we talk about it, the parks include our parks, they include sports fields and facilities, trails, community gardens, I mentioned the urban forest, community centers, recreation centers, green space, open space, and natural areas. Oh, sorry. I, wanted, I missed one of my slides that I wanted to. These are some of the interesting statistics that were cited from different studies from the um, National Park and Recreation Association. People living within one mile of a park were four times as likely to visit that park once a week or more. They had more physically active exercise sessions per week than those who lived further away from parks. Um, citizens who had better access to parks visited parks more frequently and engaged in physically active park behaviors and interestingly made fewer visits to the doctor. And neighborhoods with a greater proportion of parks were more likely to contain children who had higher levels of physical abilities. In uh, Santa Barbara, as we began to prepare for the general plan update, we worked with uh, MIG to do a baseline study of our parks and recreation facilities how they currently meet or don't meet community demand and how they're projected um, to what the needs are for um, the year 2015. And so the upshot of this is you can see that we have different classifications of parks, but basically we're about 16%, estimated to be about 16% shy in the number of acres that we as a community should be dedicating to parks and recreation facilities as compared to the national average. When we look at our facilities, we have 16 different facilities. I, I actually, when I came to Santa Barbara, and I grew up here, but as I came back as a professional that had familiarity with a lot of other park and recreation uh, programs in other communities, I was really surprised at the lack of quality facilities, much less facilities that we had as a community. 
Um, I uh, lived for many years in the West L.A. area and was familiar with Santa Monica. I always thought it was very interesting that Santa Monica had the same challenge. And, you know, they had old, outdated facilities that were small, and then you'd go down to some place um, in, in these kind of burgeoning, growing communities of Orange County, and they'd have all these beautiful facilities, just multi-purpose facilities. Well, like Santa Monica, that is our challenge. And the baseline study indicates that we really need to be looking for the, the place to construct or renovate and have one large multi-purpose uh, recreation center. And the city conducted a study several years ago um, which indicated that we definitely need a, um, a, a new aquatic facility. One of our other challenges is that we have an uneven distribution of parkland throughout our community. I'm going to focus on two types of parks because they are the parks that really um, have the most adjacency to our neighborhoods. Uh, one is the community parks. These are our larger parks that have a few more amenities, parks like Chase Palm Park, Oak Park, Shoreline. You can see this is a map of Santa Barbara and showing you that not all of the access is equal throughout our community. And this is a, a one mile radius. And if we look at neighborhood parks, you can see the same thing. We have, you know, some areas of the community where they have more easy access and others where there's either none or very little. I wanted us to think about some of the issues and challenges that we have. Um, we are at a land deficit. Uh, we are a built-out city, and the cost to purchase and convert land is very expensive. Um, we also have some redevelopment trends, which are positive in many ways for the community, but when we look at how do we compensate for that in our park and recreation and meeting the needs of our community to provide places that encourage them to be physically active or to just contribute overall to their mental health, we're a bit challenged. We are increasing our neighborhood density, you know, as people go in and they rebuild on lots and they renovate. And we are actually creating new neighborhoods in areas where we didn't really have neighborhoods before. Uh, if you think about downtown, a lot of the work that's been done on Chapala Street and some of the other areas downtown, and that's really great, it's successful, but we're not Think we're not taking enough action, because I'm not going to say we're not thinking about it, we are thinking about it, but we're not taking enough action to think about how do we design the broader community in those areas. And we also have some changing demographics in our community. We have an increasing divide between the haves and the have-nots as you have different conversations around town. People are talking about how, you know, we're experiencing the loss of the middle class. It's interesting, we, we work very closely, City Parks and Recreation work very close with the Santa Barbara School District. And, you know, we experience a different community than I think most people in Santa Barbara really are aware that exist. Um, in our elementary schools within the Santa Barbara School District, 58% of the students, their homes the, the homes that they come from are economically disadvantaged. And that is just not the vision that people have of Santa Barbara as a community. It makes a challenge for us, frankly, when we try to go after grant funds because that's not the image that people have of the Santa Barbara Riviera. 43% of all of our students in the elementary schools are English learners. It just again reflects the changing demographics of our community. And in our aging population, we, are, we will be experiencing, and the projections are that we will continue to experience as more people move into those older years, they will be living on more fixed incomes and more of our elderly population is living below the poverty line. Again, not something that is traditionally associated with Santa Barbara. So looking at our issues, even if we had the space, even if we have the, the land opportunities, we have some challenges with funding that, to me, you need to talk about both. They're a package. 
um, high cost to purchase and convert property. But we also have challenges as a community for funding um, ongoing use of the buildings, so maintenance and operation. And currently, the city, we just did a, our, updated our six-year um, capital program. Parks and recreation facilities alone have over $32 million in unfunded deferred maintenance. This is a challenge for us because we, we like to talk about new facilities and how we might do things, but really it does come down to how do we make it happen. And that needs to be a part of the discussion. Also interesting, um, the city is one of the larger providers of park and recreation services regionally. Um, the city has a population just over 90,000. South Coast from Carpinteria to the edges of Goleta is over, over 200,000. And we provide a lot of those services, and yet parks and recreation is primarily funded by the city's general fund. And that ought to be something that we talk about as we look to the future. We do have some issues with safety in our parks. Again, you can have the park, but if people perceive that it's not a safe place to go or be, they won't use them in the manner that they're intended. So we need to also talk about that as a community. And as always, it's political will. And that, that really becomes uh, the nut to crack. We have opportunities. Um, I mentioned that you know the city and the school district work very closely in a very collaborative uh, fashion. We have additional opportunities both with schools and other nonprofits and also businesses as we look to um, how we might partner together to provide some of the additional space and activity space and facilities that we, we mentioned. I'll just give you an example. There are cities who are very successfully partnered with junior high schools to build a gym and a teen center on the junior high school campus. They have the land. They are using it. It, suits, it fits their mission, enhances their mission, if we believe that physical activity is an important part of academic success, which the research shows that it is. So we have those opportunities. We really should be looking at that and having even more discussions about that. We might think about new development and partnering with residential complexes and businesses for what goes on the roof. <laughs> you know, if we're land deprived, let's talk about what goes on the roof. Is it a running track, a tennis court, a basketball court? How do we get them to incorporate more physical activity geared spaces into what they're developing? And uh, just, and this is one of the points that came out in the baseline study was, you know, where we don't have the green space to really look at how do we put activity space into that space, the limited space that we have. Uh, one of the big things for me as the Parks and Recreation Director as I go around and I'm walking through our parks is I'm amazed at how few of our parks are really designed to encourage walking. You know, uh, Oak Park is one of my favorite parks, but the trail is uneven. If you're walking with somebody, I, I take my mom walking all the time, and the only place that she can really walk is Shoreline Park because it's a gradual incline. It's got large, flat sidewalks. So we really need to be looking at how do we do more walking trails through our park that encourage people to get out and continue their walks through the communities but enjoying the parks as well. And just one final thing, I think that it is very important for us to look at updating our parks and recreation general plan. I wanted to close just with some pictures of what really happens in our parks and facilities. It really is about giving a place for people to do the things that feed their soul, feed their spirit, and encourage people to get out and enjoy the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy, for a very comprehensive, uh, compact overview of our situation here with Santa Barbara Parks. Let's move right into Terry Dressler.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. One thing that people sometimes don't realize about the Air Pollution Control District is that our primary mission is a public health mission. People think of us as protecting the environment, protecting the air quality, but the whole reason that air pollution control districts exist is to protect the public health from the effects of air pollution. Today I'm going to go over some air pollution trends, then we'll talk about some of the challenges in when you design the built community and how you have to consider the potential impacts of air pollution there. This is my good news slide. By any measure, our air quality has been getting better over the years. There are three measures of our air quality that are displayed on this slide. All of them have to do with the concentration of the pollutant ozone in our air quality. One of them is the California eight-hour standard, and all that means is that it's averaged over an eight-hour period. There's the federal eight-hour standard, also averaged over an eight-hour period. And then probably the most stringent one up there is the California one-hour standard for ozone, and this is the highest, the averaged highest one-hour health standard. And so that's the kind of one of the toughest ones to meet, although the California eight-hour standard is also very health protective as well. As you can see, the trend on all of those standards is our air is getting cleaner and cleaner. We are in compliance, or what we call attainment, with both the federal eight-hour standard for ozone and with the California one-hour standard for ozone. I believe we are the only air district in all of California who has become attainment for the California one-hour standard after they had been non-attainment. We still violate the California eight-hour standard for ozone, but as you can see, like all the other ones, we are trending toward cleaner air. Now, this is my cautionary statement. As you can see, what we did when we put together this slide is to show you what our margin of safety is. For the California state one-hour standard, while we are in attainment, we're just barely in attainment. And if you look, let's see if I can find this. Well, oh, there it is. If you look at this little piece of green up here, that's our margin of safety. So we're very close to being non-attainment there. We have a little bit more margin of safety for the federal eight-hour standard. And then, as I said before, we still violate the California eight-hour standard, and so we have a way to go before we attain that standard. This means we have to continue our vigilance, continue passing rules and regulations, and continue all of the strategies that we've been doing for the last 30 years to attain the other two standards. People often ask me, well, where does our air pollution come from? And these slides are there to show you that. It's very interesting that motor vehicles make up about half of our air pollution, and a very small amount is actually from our stationary sources of air pollution, our factories, the oil and gas industry, all of our industrial sources. And the reason is that for the last 30 years, these sources have been controlled significantly. Also, while the on-road motor vehicles are still 50 percent of our air pollution, they have been controlled very significantly as well. And while we have had a growth in vehicle miles traveled throughout the years, we have also seen a reduction in air pollution from those vehicles because of how much cleaner cars have gotten. There's another interesting piece of the pie here. Uh, that is, uh, I always have to talk about, and that is for that 43 percent of the, our uh, air pollution, uh, nitrogen oxide air pollution, comes from a source that we can't control. And that comes from the container ships that are uh, coming into the uh, uh, ports of Long Beach and uh, Los Angeles from uh, South Asia. Um, they go through the Santa Barbara Channel because the shipping lanes go through the Santa Barbara Channel, and they represent 43% uh, of the air pollution currently that affects Santa Barbara County. Out by 2020, we expect those ships to represent 75% of the air pollution affecting Santa Barbara County. 
they, uh, uh, we expect that we are going to continue to get gains in reducing air pollution from all the other sectors. And yet, the, uh, without the very strong action by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, this sector could put us in danger of going backwards in our air quality and actually being non-attainment for the health standards. This uh, demonstrates the statement I just made. Uh, as you can see, the blue, the area in, whoops, what did I just do? There we go. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, uh, we project that our, our pollutants that we're in control of, the, the mobile sources and the on, uh, onshore industrial sources, that, that we will experience ever decreasing air pollution emissions from those sources, while the marine shipping uh, in the red here uh, emissions uh, we expect to increase. And so we are in the process right now of um, doing everything we can to get into control of those emissions. We um, have sued the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, unfortunately, we've been forced to have to sue them in order to take the uh, correct action to control those emissions. Uh, we are also have uh, invested some of our grant funding into the uh, development of innovative technologies, retrofit technologies on some of these ships, and in partnership with APL shipping lines, we have actually installed uh, these devices in one of their ships and are currently testing it now to uh, determine uh, if it's cost effective and, if, and, and uh, also that it works in its design in reducing air pollution. One of the newest and, and most concerning issues uh, that's come about in the last five years is the impact of uh, diesel emissions on public health. Uh, the particulates that are emitted from the con uh, combustion of diesel uh, are the number one air toxic contaminant in California. Uh, there have been several studies, children health study at UCSB, and uh, also studies throughout Europe that have showed that the location uh, uh, putting people located, uh, locating people close to major thoroughfares where there's lots of diesel emissions um, uh, increase their risk of developing uh, lung disease significantly. Um, when we're talking about land use decisions and we're talking about general plans, we have to consider that because uh, sometimes uh, the only land left to build on is that that's re uh, really close to major thoroughfares. And you have to consider that when you're uh, designing your communities to make sure that you don't locate people to, in areas that put them at risk uh, for uh, uh, increased air, uh, with increased air pollution. Um, there are tools to help us make those decisions. The Air, California Air Resources Board has a land use handbook that um, it gives uh, com uh, communities some general idea about uh, how to build their communities uh, to uh, uh, prevent locating them next to excess uh, uh, health risk due to air pollution. And, um, and, and what that handbook is actually teeing up right now is a, a bit of a conflict between um, what's called in our industry the, the tension between density and exposure. Um, a lot of land use planning now is moving toward uh, denser communities that are more amenable to transportation design so that we can get people out of their cars, they don't have to travel as far to work, they don't have to travel as far to the store, and we can put them in public transportation. But what happens when you pack people closer together, if you don't take care of your traffic problems, you can uh, ex increase their exposure to air toxic contaminants. Uh, or if you put people very close to uh, uh, well-trafficked uh, transportation corridors like major freeways, you can increase their exposure to air toxics, and that's something that you, you want to avoid. Another thing that's come up with the desire to do mixed-use developments is you have to be care careful which uses you mix together because you don't want to, to put people living next to a, an industrial use that's going to increase their exposure to air pollution. There are um, uh, potential um, mitigations, uh, the um, kind of jargony one up there, MERV 13, just re uh, 
is a, um, a reference to a, a new uh, high efficiency particulate filters that can be put on residences uh, that can uh, filter the particulates out and make the indoor living environment safer if, if these residences are located close to toxic uh, air pollutants. And also there's a study in Sacramento being done right now about the planting of trees and how they might filter the particulates that come off of, um, of um, uh, uh, trafficked areas uh, in major thoroughfares. From our local perspective, I just think it's important that we all understand that our air quality is improving and that's a good thing, but we have to re retain uh, our vigilance and we have to continue with the plan that we have to uh, continue to adopt our regulations to keep the uh, air, air pollution uh, on the downward trend. Um, diesel emissions is a big concern and there are uh, many statewide regulations that have recently been adopted uh, to address that problem. Uh, Santa Barbara uh, currently has pretty low density and so one of the things that we're lucky about here is that our exposure to toxics is lower than in other areas. On the other hand, because of the way we have designed our community, uh, as Dr. Jack Jackson pointed out, a lot of people have to drive a long way to get to work. And what that does is increase air pollution someplace else. And so while we might have the benefit of the low exposure due to low density, we have the disbenefit of that of excess emissions uh, from uh, people having to uh, drive too far to get to work. Our um, future planning needs need to balance um, this uh, uh, this tension between density and exposure and uh, I, uh, I think that uh, that can be uh, done through careful planning and, um, and to make sure that all of the, the um, uh, agencies that are involved in this type of planning work together uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, cooperation with the community to design the community in a way that we both keep the exposure to toxics down and we also reduce the amount of miles people have to drive to get uh, their shopping done and to get to work. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go to Brian Welch and then we'll be talking with the panel and with all of you. We'll use the time as productively as we can to get through our last speaker and get on to the Q&A. Does this thing work? Yeah, we'll change it. Okay. This is advanced. Okay. All right. I've spent the better part of my career um, actually trying to understand better the relationship between urban form and travel behavior, and that's a fancy way of answering questions about um, why does every major metropolitan area in North America have pretty severe peak hour, peak directional congestion. Why do we have three and a half parking spaces in North America for every car? You know, those are, those are questions that we know a lot more about than we did say um, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And what I wanted to fo focus on in that area just for a few minutes th uh, this morning is this whole notion of the relationship between health and urban form. And, Dr. Jackson, I think, highlighted a great deal of that, but we know a lot more about this than we did before, and I think there was a lot of anecdotal evidence, but now we know that we can measure this. What, what has happened? Um, you know, the, some of the public health trends that you've seen, and Dr. Jackson highlighted these, we do know that um, walking has become much less of a prevalent form of transportation than it historically was. Um, we have built the, the predominant form of urban development, as we know, in North America for since, say, 1940, post-World War II, 1945, has been uh, suburban in nature, uh, separated land uses, isolating them one from another, and pretty much fo uh, forcing people to go from place to place uh, in their automobiles, and that's led to a decline. Now we have even more evidence, I think, pointing towards the choices that we're making about, about urban form and what, it, and what some of the public health consequences are. Reed Ewing, who is a colleague of, of mine as well as Dr. Jackson, he looked at 200,000 people uh, living in different types of urban environments 
And he concluded that, that there's empirical evidence that uh, in a sprawling environment, you're going to have more of a tendency to walk less, higher blood pressure. Um, the, study, the study out of San, San Diego State and Lawrence Frank work as well are, are all pointing in the same direction. You're probably saying, well, well Brian, you know, we, all, we all kind of know, you know these things, but, but what, what's really going on? What, what are the policy implications? Boy, this thing really jumps. Um, what we what we have to conclude is that the choices that we make as as um, the the manner in which our communities are developing and growing, or if you're already a mature community, is that the built environment and the risk of obesity is definitely there are definitely linkages and there are choices that we can make that affect the outcomes. This is a this is a neighborhood, um, and I'm just gonna I'm just showing you this one example so you can get a sense of how the how urban form has resulted in differences in travel behavior. Um, this is called the avenues in Salt Lake City. Something that we're doing as a firm is we're trying to get a much better empirical sense of really what difference does density make, what difference does the diversity of land uses, what difference does transit make in terms of how much people drive. This, this neighborhood called the Avenues in Salt Lake City, it's a grid system. It's a, it's a more traditional neighborhood with smaller blocks, um, no cul-de-sacs, very, very different than a lot of the post-World War II development. You can go back one. What you notice here in this particular part of Salt Lake City, the uh, this one variable design, it, it's 40% more walkable than the other parts of the region. And so you ask yourself, if you build a neighborhood that big, or a series of neighborhoods that's 40% more walkable, what do you think happens? You get more walking. And what, what, I, wanted to, what I wanted to emphasize is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of people are going to say, well, Brian, um, you, you know, you can you look at these maps, you look at places, different places in North America, why are some states healthier than others and all those kind of things. And some people are going to say, well, you know, Boulder, Colorado is a lot healthier because a lot of healthy people live there because they want to live there. And they move there, so obviously you're going to get a healthier population. What I, I would argue is, you know, there, there, is that, there is something to that whole notion of self-selection, that people do gravitate towards certain types of behavior because that's the way they are. However, I think what's more compelling for me as a professional is the fact that, is the fact that, you know, if you, there's a real self-fulfilling prophecy in our land use planning. If you build environments that discourage walking, that make you drive virtually everywhere you want to go, that make transit almost impossible to serve, you are going to get very little walking and very little biking and a lot of driving. And so from that perspective, I think as policy choices, what we have to consider is that you can say, well, you know, 95% of all trips are by car. So why are we even paying attention to the other modes? Well, the whole problem is, is that we made choices over time that resulted in those percentages. It didn't just happen that way. Um, it was purposeful. So if we're going to change those trends, I think we have to be purposeful in the decisions that we make from now on, and that means that you need to give people at least the option. Um, if you don't, you can say, well, this, this environment is not dense enough to provide transit. Well, you know, I, I think there's evidence that you can make changes along those lines. So there's the whole notion of at least in your planning, make decisions and make choices that give people more options than they're otherwise going to have, because I think if you don't, we know what's going to result and all the trends that you've heard about today are going to continue to move forward. But there is the opportunity to do something different. And now we know that the, the relationships are measurable as well. That's what I had. Thank you very much. Again, thank you all of the panel members for your very concise presentations here uh, this afternoon. And now we'd like to get on to some of the interesting questions and topics that you've raised here through the card method. And uh, one of these where there was actually a number of cards turned in had to do with the 
whole issue of population growth. And that hasn't been addressed really by any of the speakers uh, this morning and as we go into the afternoon. And so the question is, we're asking, well, should we be looking at this as a root cause of the cause, as Dr. Jackson uh, used the expression? Should we be looking at controlling that? Does that have a potential beneficial effect on uh, public or uh, personal health outcomes? So we'd certainly enjoy hearing any comments from any of the panel members on this subject. And uh, Dick, would you like to pick up on that one, please? Why don't I lead off? Um, when I started medical school, the population of California was 16 million. It is now 38 million. When I was born, the country was 140 million. It's now 300 million. It will be 600 million um, by the end of this century. Population and the planet was 2 billion when I was born in 1945, and it's 6 billion now. Um, it is a huge driver of all of these issues, but our consumption patterns, the North American consumption patterns, are so high that they are driving this even more. Of interest, one of the luminaries that came out to argue very strongly against uh, or express great alarm about climate change and the destruction of our environment was none less than Pope Benedict himself, who um, talked a lot about these issues. Uh, there are a lot of benefits that could come from um, population management. The, the most effective rate to have a population be at replacement rate is education, 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 empowerment of women. And anything that uh, goes on in a society that improves the knowledge base and economic well-being of our population, is a, it, that's the only thing that really works. Okay. Any other panel members care to take this up? Terry? I think it's very interesting to note that um, while uh, the number of vehicle miles traveled uh, and the number of cars in Santa Barbara has uh, grown significantly since 1970, the number of violations of the state ozone standard or the all ozone standards has significantly been reduced. And the reason for this is technology. Technology came to the rescue. We were able to reduce the air pollution from the automobiles. We were able to reduce the air pollution from the industrial sources. However, there's going to reach a time when technology is going to have done all that it can do. And then we will not be able to maintain this steady reduction in air pollution if we continue to increase the number of miles that we travel. And uh, we've been lucky so far. Uh, we've dodged the bullet simply because of technology, but we can't trust that we're always going to be able to do that. I mean, people like to say, oh, well, there's hydrogen and there's electric cars and there's all sorts of things like that. But, um, you know, you don't really see that that is on the horizon in the short term. Uh, we really have to start building our communities in such a way that we don't rely on the automobile so much if we want to continue to make the gains that we've made in the past for cleaning up the air. Okay, very good. There was uh, another uh, set of questions having to do with some of the points, uh, Anne, you raised in your presentation about uh, the accessibility to quality food or fast food, as the case may be. So some people were asking, well, can we control access to fast food restaurants? Can we uh, limit trans fat, as you suggested? Can we begin to look at limit limitations on uh, high fructose corn syrup? And then someone asked, did you see the film King of Corn? I'm not sure what that film is about, but perhaps it deals with some of these issues. So I don't know if, Ann, you'd like to take up any of these. And last but not least was a question about, well, how do we educate our children about proper eating, healthy living, and so forth, because all of these things are obviously related. Wow, those are a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, to start with the can we limit the fast food restaurants, yes, other cities have done that. They've put a moratorium on the proliferation of new fast food restaurants, so when one, they're not closing them down, but they're, as one goes out of business, they'll maybe let another one come in, but they're not letting it just go on and on and you know, new businesses starting that way. Um, the trans fat issue is that can be done, I believe, on a city-wide basis. I don't know all the, you know, people from the city know a lot more about this than I do, but I know it has been done. New York City did it. Um, 
you know, so municipalities and states, they have a lot of control over these issues as well. And then the third part was about children and how Healthy do we... Healthy living. <laughs> well, we do nutrition. have this, we do have um, now federally mandated wellness policies that are um, required in all the public schools in the, in the United States. A lot of us have been involved with working with the school districts on developing and, and now we're in the implementation process of these wellness policies and they specifically have to do with nutrition education, bringing back a lot of the things that have been lost because there's been such an emphasis on the strict academics and kids getting into college and, and all of these things. So we've lost the basics of nutrition and home economics and PE and how to make PE fun again. And um, so anyway, the three elements of the wellness policy are nutrition, physical activity, and health education. And those are required elements, and there are groups all over this state, and I know all over the country that are working on those, so that hopefully will get us somewhere, and hopefully it won't get cut out of the governor's budget. Very good. Uh, Brian, would you like to join yeah, in? The, um, I think a good example is um, communities often struggle with trying to regulate certain types of businesses because they're, they're allowed by right. Um, in say commercial districts, but what is in fact very effective is you just you don't allow drive-throughs, and so if you drive around Santa Monica, you're going to drive for a long time before you try and find a drive-through restaurant. They just sim simply don't allow them. Mm -hmm. So and, and it really does work. After the riots in Los Angeles, about half the liquor stores did not in the city did not allow them to reopen, and crime in those areas. Very nice epidemiologic study showing the crime and all kinds of urban problems went down as the prevalence of liquor stores went down. And I think the same could be shown. I'm just shocked at the political obstruction that the fast food industry puts up against menu labeling and a whole set of controls. I think, um, from as a health person's point of view, it's disgraceful. Yeah, if you look at the, if, what the fast food restaurants will tell you is that their, their studies demonstrate that they lose 30 to 35 percent of their business if they don't have a drive through Well, you know, that's, <laughs> that's pretty telling. Yeah, and I think this goes to the point of the role of research in documenting the connection between access to quality or lack of quality foods and then the public health patterns that uh, uh, Dr. Jackson and others have illustrated here, that if you do have solid evidence, you can begin to establish that nexus and then provide the basis or foundation for public policy and ultimately regulation. There is another uh, series of questions here dealing with the fundamental issue of this whole uh, forum today, and that has to do with the uh, design of the physical environment and health and establishing that connection. And what are some of the more specific policy recommendations that the city of Santa Barbara might entertain as it goes forward in uh, updating its comprehensive plan, its general plan? Uh, maybe this is something Nancy would like to comment on. Obviously, the parks and recreation and open space elements play a key role here. And maybe others can say, what are some of the other key policy areas that would have a potential positive effect on public health, uh, being one of our core subject matters here. So again, we'd love to have the panel members uh, address that topic. Anybody like to join in here? Um, I, I'll take a start at it. I, I think, you know, it's interesting, I went through and I read the um, land design element um, of the current city's general plan in preparing for this. And all of the things that occurred to me, I was amazed to see a lot of those policies are already in there. So yes, there are some things that I think that we could look at and talk very specifically about, um, but the nuts and bolts are in the current land use element. It really comes down to the political will to make things happen as they should and giving priority to different things. Um, so, but I do think there are some, um, and I don't, and I guess it comes down to policy, but I think that we need to look at use and reuse. We need to look at, when we're looking at development and new development, 
um, we need to be asking ourselves about the quality of life for the people who are going to live or work there. And a part of that has to do with transportation. A part of that has to do with access to, um, you know, grocery stores and, and markets and things like that, but also access to opportunities to be more physically active and the walkable communities. Um, but I, I think it really will come down to how, how much do we want it that we make it a priority in what we're looking at. Um, I actually want to go back to one comment, if we could, um, because uh, the, the opening comment was about do we need to be concerned about, you know, the increases in population. And I'm not sure that that's Santa Barbara's issue. Um, I think that there are you know, businesses and agencies existing in Santa Barbara that are fully aware that a third of our workforce that help make our business and government and, you know, corporates um, all work in the city of Santa Barbara, a third of that workforce comes from the south and approximately a third of that workforce comes from the north. And so for us as a community, as we look at what it takes to have our community be a success and to, to thrive, we really have to be talking about recruitment and retention and how do we, that is a part, that's a part of our extended community. Um, and that, you know, is all related to transportation and, and all of those kinds of issues. Um, and that's why we have such a big discussion about affordable housing. So I just, that didn't get addressed, and I, I just, that's, that's the issue that we deal with more as Santa Barbara, um, and certainly I think, you know, the government stipulation of, you know, the number of housing units that we'll add and all of that, but that, that becomes the big conversation. Um, so I'll... Okay, I'll, very good. Terry, would you like to join in? Um, I think it's very important uh, when you're looking at uh, doing the long-term planning that you under that people understand that uh, agencies like the Air Pollution Control District uh, have a very hard time fixing poor planning when incompatible adjacent land uses are allowed through a planning process. And then all of a sudden people are sort of in an uproar because these uh, incompatible adjacent land uses have occurred. They come to us and they want us to fix them. And we're not really a planning agency. And in fact, I often uh, tell people uh, that unlike a lot of planning agencies that have discretion as to whether or not they allow somebody to build this or that facility or building or business, if a company comes to us and with an application for a permit and they can comply with all of our rules, they get the permit. There's no discretion there. And so it's very difficult for us sometimes when uh, something as simple as a wood-burning pizza oven that gets allowed is next to a three-story building and the smoke from the pizza oven goes into the three-story office building. Uh, it, it becomes very difficult for us to regulate that because you have uh, two people who have rights. Uh, one of them has a right to clean air and the other one has a right to make pizzas. Uh, and uh, those, those rights is conflict. Fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, from, an, from a regulatory agency perspective, um, I would uh, caution uh, allow uh, thinking that regulations after the planning process are going to repair poor planning. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, excellent points. Um, there's a interesting commentary here. Growing up in Florida in the 60s, all students at my junior high school were uh, required to do 100 sit-ups within three minutes, and by the end of the year there was 100 percent success what happened to PE and how do we get it back? Anybody want to take up that issue? I'll, I'll speak to that because that's been something that has been one of those difficult things um, throughout my career, having seen just the demise of physical education from elementary school all the way through college. And, you know, ultimately it all goes back to funding. I sound like a broken record here, but that's what it is. 
And that's why physical education doesn't get funded in, in academic settings in any of those levels. Um, and it goes back again to what are our priorities. And so that's why we don't have PE in our schools. The schools that are lucky enough to have it, that, that PE element is most likely funded by, you know, a parents group, a PTA, a grant, um, a fundraising arm for that particular school, not necessarily the school district. Um, it doesn't change the priorities for us as people, but ultimately that is what it comes down to. The second part of that is it really is parental uh, involvement and modeling of behaviors and expectations of behaviors. And we, all of our lives have changed. You know, we all have, you know, two working uh, parents and families. Everybody's busy. You know, the, how the, how we entertain our kids has changed over the years. Um, it, it really, I think if we were going to change one thing for our kids' health, it would be how do we reintegrate physical activity into the elementary schools and it will grow through the rest of the school system. When I worked at UCLA, we provided recreation programs for students, faculty, and staff. For students, the unbelievable pro uh, motivator that, that we could use was that it will help your academic grades. If you are exercising two or three times a week, we can show you studies that will prove that it will increase your, your um, academic performance. You know, it's like making that mind-body connection, um, but it really comes down to money and being able to fund what we say is most important. Very good. Uh, Dr. Jackson? Uh, in poor schools, in, in, in a sense, the principals and directors will say, you know, I had the choice between PE, music, and art, and mm -hmm. I picked music and art, Doc, and now I feel bad about it. And um, No Child Left Behind has really subordinated uh, these other activities, and I think we've got to have a larger view of our uh, education of our children. Uh, yes, it's about money, but we're not going to fix um, a lot of these problems purely with PE at schools. Um, the activity has got to be integrated back into children's lives. There are a lot of burdens for people commuting 30, 40 miles each way. The, you know, the risk of death from car injuries, risk of high blood pressure doing all that driving, the risk of not being home for dinner because you're sitting in a car an hour or so each way. I mean, these all begin to add up. And yeah, maybe there are some risks um, from density and you get a slightly more ozone if you have people closer together, but you get some real benefits. And maybe we need to stop focusing on very narrow endpoints and think about what's best for the overall human being, the overall family, and the overall community. And here's a whole series of questions. Uh, let's say we are successful in getting people to walk and bicycle more, then will they not be exposed to some of the uh, elements, as Terry pointed out, uh, air pollution, congestion, lack of safety, smoke from people smoking? So, and I know, uh, Dr. Jackson, you had addressed some of these points uh, that are inherent in the built environment. So yeah, I'm just going to push back a little on this, which is yeah. that um, unless people are out there bicycling and exercising, they don't create the political will to then demand safe bike lanes. And, and you know, it, none of this is fixed with one single step. It's, it, it is a societal change. But it does work over time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Very good. Terry? And I think that this is where the Air Pollution Control District uh, and a very important part of our mission in, in public education can help out. Uh, we had very much success during the Zaka fire of informing people when it was safe to do exercise and when it wasn't. And uh, we, we, I mean, with the, the uh, technology of web, of the, you know, uh, World Wide Web um, and all this other electronic technology we have, we have really a great opportunity to communicate with people. And sure, there are days uh, when it's not helpful to get out there and exercise. And uh, we can inform people when those days are. Most of the days in Santa Barbara, we're really blessed. And most of the days in uh, Santa Barbara County, it is helpful to exercise. And should you jog next to the freeway? No. Uh, and should we build uh, uh, places where people can get their exercise so they're uh, in places that don't have exposure to things like 
um, uh, particulates that are uh, generated by freeway traffic? Yes, we should. But once again, this is where uh, ag the agencies can work with the community and help uh, educate them and inform them uh, of the right way to get the right kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, Terry, while you're up there at the mic, uh, question was directed at you actually. How can people who notice uh, severe violations of air quality uh, regulations get in contact with you? What's the mechanism that they can use to uh, perform their watchdog function, so to speak? You can call us on the phone, 961-8800, uh, and you tell us and we will investigate it. Um, you can also write us uh, emails. Uh, we have a website um, and um, uh, that you can uh, access and uh, be able to uh, contact us through email. Um, but the fastest way to get action on uh, air pollution uh, violations that you perceive are happening is simply to call us on the phone and we investigate um, every uh, air pollution complaint that we receive at the Air Pollution Control District. So many of the uh, issues that have been raised here have to do with lifestyle choices, healthy living, healthy eating, how we design our environment and the choices people make in terms of where they live and how they travel to and from home and work and so forth. And so the question uh, grouping we have here has to do with how do we get beyond this car culture that we've created here? Uh, we're somewhat locked in, and so I think people are wondering what are some of the incremental steps uh, that we can take as a community to uh, reduce our dependence uh, on those uh, automobiles. Anybody want to take that up, please? I'll, I'll just lead off. Um, Marin County was very concerned their kids weren't walking to school. Only about 10% of the kids were doing it. Um, with very aggressive programs, starting with the PTA, working through the principals, they got it up to about 50% of the kids walking to school. Benefits of that are better crosswalks, bulb outs, um, traffic calming, better sidewalks, more eyes on the street, bub better public participation. It became normative to see kids out walking. And not only kids, but now old folks and other folks were out walking. Um, police officers were on mountain bikes uh, patrolling this same area. And it now seems like common sense, not an oddball event. Um, I, I think the other takeaway here is you start with the children in many ways because and we did that with tobacco, we did that with uh, a lot of these other issues. It's a good place to focus from. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other panel members want to tackle this one? I think that to me is one of the biggest um, areas that we can look at as a community is how do we encourage and make our neighborhoods and our, our business communities more walkable because I think and the safe routes to school has been really important. We've seen the connectedness between the schools and if they have parks adjacent, it just encourages more of that. But I, I believe the same thing. I think it's just starting in the immediate neighborhoods and making them, getting over some of those barriers that create, um, you know, that encourage people not to walk and instead make it a more walkable community. And then looking at the connection between our pedestrian pathways and our trails and incorporating our parks and just making it more of um, a pleasurable opportunity. I really believe that people will get out there and walk more, mm -hmm. um, making it safe for kids, but making it a pleasurable experience for adults. Mm -hmm. And behavior is contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, what your friends and yeah. neighbors are doing affects us. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And knowing that we'll have to end the session soon, we have the hall for a limited period of time. Uh, we wanted to conclude with uh, one key question here, which is really uh, advice of the panel to our Santa Barbara policymakers. What, what can they do to overcome some of the major obstacles? What sort of uh, ideas would you like to leave them with as uh, we go forward in updating the city uh, general plan process? I still own a condo in Sacramento and 25 years ago when I would go to Sacramento, I hated it. Uh, there were vacant lots everywhere. It was not much fun walking around. There wasn't much to do. They have done a wonderful job with that city. Um, there's a lot of four-story buildings. They've um, gotten rid of the pa parking lots that were filled with debris. Uh, there's lively retail. There's lively community. It's a 24-hour downtown. Um, it really works, and by the way, the tax base, the revenue base, and the quality of life have really improved with the right kind of political leadership. 
Very good. I think I'd like to quote from uh, Dr. Jackson from earlier today, where he said, I, I put a little box around this, public health is creating the conditions where people can be healthy. So as we go forward, we need to create healthy environments, including walkability, including grocery stores that have healthy foods in new developments and not just, you know, convenience stores or liquor stores. And um, just, you know, incorporating these various components that you've heard today that are going to promote health and have, you're changing the environment around you and not just, um, just proliferating the unhealthy behaviors. Okay, very good. Nancy? Um, I actually, other than speaking to the leaders who will be me being the decision makers, I would speak to the rest of you because if I've learned one thing from working in local government, it is the voice of the people who show up to talk at meetings about what's important to them as a community member that guides policy. You cannot leave it to the people who are the decision makers juggling everything because trust me, there will be singular, single purpose voices out there that will influence policy and it is important that the community participates in local government. So I encourage you, you've heard a lot of information today about how to improve our community. All those people who are decision makers, they have your best interests at heart. So show up and talk to them about what's important to you. You know, and that really guides policy. Um, so I encourage you to use your voice. Okay, very good. Terry? I'd encourage two things. Uh, one is use the good science. There's a lot of science out there. There are a lot of analysis tools out there and that are available for to help you make your decisions. Um, don't be afraid of it. Uh, all of it can be explained. And uh, I think that uh, if you uh, have your staffs, make sure that they bring the science to you and explain and take the time to explain it. That will really help you uh, in your decision making process. Mm -hmm. And the other is, I guess I'll put under the title of collaboration. Um, a lot of times there can be some polarities develop when you have these kinds of uh, community decisions uh, to make these community decisions. I run into it all the time. I, I regulate one of um, the toughest um, and richest industries uh, in, in, in the United States, and that's the oil and gas industry. Um, if they wanted to, uh, they could come to our board of directors and fight everything we did. Um, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because we at the Air Pollution Control District work really hard to sit down with them and come to solutions that are going to further our mission, reduce air pollution, clean up the air, and allow them the opportunity to comply with our rules in a way that they can continue to do their business. And so I would really um, uh, uh, advise the decision makers to try to stay away from polarities if they can and move more toward a collaborative mo model. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Brian, to wrap this up? Well, I think that elected and appointed officials and those that, um, that, that they're serving, many of the trends that we've seen that have gotten us into the pickle we're in right now are going to require uh, taking positions and stands that right now are going to be not very popular, but 10 years from now people are going to look back and say, thank goodness somebody did this and what I've seen happen before is that there's usually a, a you know one or more people who are willing to to step out and and take what may be going against the grain in an unpopular stand but ultimately it starts to steer this you know this big ocean liner in a different direction and and uh, you know it's this whole notion of being visionary and like I say that you know if we want to have a 2015 or a 2020 that doesn't follow some of the more disturbing trends, well, things are going to have to change. Very good. Well, we managed to work our way through pretty much all the questions here, and I want to thank the audience and the questions you turned in, but most of all, let's thank our panels, uh, members, and speakers for their comments today. And um, 
let's also be sure to thank once again Jane Breckwald and the Community Health Coalition for their efforts in putting this whole program together. Thank you, Jane, and all the members of your group. Thank you all for coming out today. We hope to have this program rebroadcast on local cable television so we'll expose more people to the positive uh, atmosphere of this forum. And uh, we hope to see you at future sessions related to Plan Santa Barbara. Thank you very much for your attendance uh, today. Bye-bye. The last time that I hit burn like this, I swear, oh, the last time that I hit burn like this. Hey.